All right, so today we're looking on flow chart. How we be flowing. This is how we flow. Ooh. I just start carrying up and something. Okay, sorry guys. All right, so flow chart now. What are flow charts? So looking on your screen, you will see that basically a flow chart is a diagram which is used to represent your algorithm or program. All right, so as I was saying before, your flow chart is basically a diagram that represents the, the flow or procedure sequence that you use to, in your algorithm or program. Um, the operations to perform arithmetic computations, make comparisons, etc., are shown inside boxes or different shapes in the flowchart. Um, so you are going to show from start to stop every well, more every single thing that would have been done in your algorithm or program must be represented using a diagram. The sequence of operations is indicate, indicated by lines joining the boxes, and we're going to look in that. Now, your flowchart must have a start, just like your algorithm, it must have a start and it must have a stop. The, the stop will depend on what type of flowchart you are doing or what type of algorithm it is. Good? So what is the purpose of a flowchart? So the flowchart may be used to clarify the logic of a problem. So as I said before in previous class, um, your algorithm for a particular problem, you will have multiple solutions. However, you want to look on which problem is most logical and will yield the, the same output. So even though Tom's um, algorithm is going to have 15 steps and still yield the output, but somebody else own probably have 25 or probably have 10. So you have to assess the different solutions now and see which one is most logical. Now, the best way to look at it, the best way to look at it is through your flowchart. Instead of looking on the words or the steps, it is best to look at basically just a diagram of the problem. Next, to analyze the actions resulting from a set of conditions. So what will happen? What are the outputs? And basically, it also assists with identifying errors, right? Because you will be able to pick up, same thing with your trace table, you'll be able to pick up what is it that is not necessarily working or linking back to a particular process. It starts out the procedural steps of a program. So this is going to look on basically step one, step two, step three, step four. So that is the procedural part, just basically the sequence of your program which should come. It acts as an aid to program construction and coding. Um, so it makes it easy for you to move or transition into um, program implementation from the algorithm stage. Good. As documentation for your program. Now, when we looked on the steps in problem solving, the last step was documentation. Documentation, as I said, will outline partially the how, the what. How is it that we, we, we use a particular software? What is it used for? How will it, um, how will it work, basically, to the user? So this is like your user manual. So the flowchart now will also depict 
how is it that your your program will flow as a doc for documentation purposes? What is that enough? All right, so when we're preparing our flow chart, one, make the flow chart clear, neat, and easy to follow. This is going to look now on how is it that you link your shapes. One, your, 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 the shapes that are being drawn must be clear. So we'll be, we'll be able to see exactly what that shape is. Then you have the neatness part. So you should be labeling as you go along so persons know exactly what this aspect is about. And all this will make sense when we start looking on the shape. So the flowchart should not be confusing. Looking on it, it should be easy to dissect and understand what is it that the program is doing. Right? Ensure that the flowchart has a logical start and finish. When we are looking on loops, you will see in terms of the logical start and stop. When we're looking on algorithms with sequence, it will be easy to detect. It will be easy to identify where your um, algorithm will start and stop. However, however, once it is that you are doing one now with repetition, then it will be a little bit trickier. Right. All right, good. Next, avoid cross flow lines. Um, so when you are connecting the different shapes, you need to ensure that the, the lines don't cross. And it will come back to the whole aspect of being neat, clear, and easy to follow. If your lines are all over the place, then it will be difficult for you to understand the, the algorithm there. All right, make comparison instructions simple, yes or no. Once it is that you're doing a comparison or you're doing a loop, you must label your lines with yes or no or true and or false. Um, we're going to come to that. You must outline basically what is going to happen if the condition is true and if the condition is false. So when you outline or when you label true, this is saying that this will happen if your condition is true, or this will happen if your condition is false. The flow chart is generally down or to the right, otherwise use arrowhead. Um, so we flow, all right, so this will make sense a little bit later on. So once it is that, um, you are creating your flow chart. Normally, you, you will continue in a downward motion, or if it is that you have to branch off, your first branch will always be to the right. So in the cases of true and false or yes and no um, options, your yes will be to the right in most cases, while your no is going to be to the left. Ensure logical correctness, and we looked and said we would have said this before that it ensures that the the algorithm itself is sound, your program is sound. So you don't want to do something that is false because the the algorithm itself is going to transition into program development. If it is that you have a shaky algorithm, then more than likely what is going to happen is that your program is also going to be shaky, which means that it's not going to yield the correct results. Be consistent in level of detail, and that is somewhat self-explanatory. So you're going to be consistent with your flow chart, whatever it is showing in terms of the labeling. All right, so advantages of a flow chart. It helps to simplify the logic of a program. We explained that already. Are more complete than decision tables. 
So basically, it gives you a complete look of your program to come. Can be used to test the logic of a program. All right, so this will come back now. So it will link it with your trace table to see how is it that it will work logically. And that is why we always use um, data that will be used in the program to test your um, algorithm or in your trace table because you want to see exactly how is it going to work with the real data that it is supposed to are useful for documentations and we explained that already all right disadvantages now can be lengthy now depending on the length of your algorithm um your flow chart will also be a lengthy one it can span onto multiple pages for at your level, basically, you will not be given a lengthy algorithm. You can be given one that probably spans on two pages, but nothing crazy. But you do have algorithms that are very, very lengthy. You do have flowcharts that are very, very lengthy. Um, not easy to change um, in terms of, it. well, it depends on what you're using to create your flowcharts, but if it is that you're going to make changes to the flowchart, it means that you would have made changes to your algorithm. Tend to produce bad, badly structured program design. It depends on how analytical you are in terms of picking up the whole logical aspect of your flowchart, of your algorithm. If you can be able to identify from your flowchart where it is that your program is weak, then it will not lead to a badly structured um, program design. If it is that you don't, then it will lead to that. It's difficult to construct when the logic is complex. Now, depending on how tedious your if statements, your loops are, um, your flowchart can be difficult to construct and it's best to take it in a step-by-step -step process. So even after creating the algorithm and then thinking that the program implementation will be a walk in the park, there are times when it is not as easy to construct based on how complex you made your program, your algorithm. Maybe large and difficult to follow, same thing as lengthy there so i don't need to explain that point all right so shapes and functions so now we want to look on the different shapes that are we will use in our flow chart so the first one is your oval right that's your oval right there so your oval is used to signify the starting and ending point of your flowchart. So at any point in time, your flowchart will have two ovals, one at start, one at stop. Good. Example here. So after you create your drawing, you will add the text inside of it to signify what is this. So is this the start or is this the stop? Go to house, go to house. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's your advantage. We have a couple minutes left, and then we're going to restart. So let us see if we can. All right, so we said the oval used for start and stop. All right, next shape. So our next shape is our parallelogram. 
and I would say a lean rectangle. So your rectangle, your parallelogram now is used for your input and your output. So once it is that you are going to have right enter enter name, read name, you're going to use your parallelogram. If you're going to have um sum in sum, then you would have your parallelogram. In the cases where you have, um, let's say you're going to ask the user to enter something and you give the output instruction, then you're going to have your read statement. What you can do is that you can combine, combine those two operations. And instead of having write and read, you can just have read by itself. So if you're going to say, all right, enter a number, read num. So in this case, the option is yours. You can have write, enter, enter number, read number, or you can just have one diagram with read number, read num in here. The option is yours. Hope that part was clear. All right, so our next shape is our rectangle. Our rectangle now is used for processing any form of calculation that needs to be done, any form of assignment, you're going to use your rectangle. So you can have sum equal num1 plus num2. If you're saying that count is equal to one, if you're saying that GCT is equal to 16.5, um percent or 16.5 percent would be that that 0 0.165 because as i said before we don't use percentage sign so if it is that you're giving an a value an initial value to a variable you would use your rectangle rectangle if it is that you're going to carry out any calculation you would use your rectangle So we have parallelogram, and we said that the parallelogram is for your input output. You have your rectangle. Your rectangle is used for your processing. All right, so now we're looking on our arrows. Now your arrows are basically used to show the flow of your flowchart where it is that it is going next which direction it is going so you your arrows must have a head on it pointing to where it is going so you attach the shape and basically just show the flow of your algorithm which which is downward or we set to the right and then we can branch to the left but we mostly go down right Okay. All right, so here we have an example for a flowchart for a sequence, which means that there is no loop, there is no selection in it. So here we have to the right, we have our input using our parallelogram. Then we have our process using our rectangular, rectangle, then we have our output using another parallelogram. In between each shape, you will notice that there is an arrow showing the flow of the um, algorithm here. Good. Example. Here we have our, here we have start. I would say that your algorithm, your flowchart will have two ovals, one which is signet showing the start of your flowchart and one that's in the end part or the of your flowchart. So here we have start, good. And missing from this is the arrowhead. So if it is that you don't, then you will not get your full mark. So here we have start. Here there was instructions to the user asking them to enter um, a value. 
and it's, that value is stored in the variable called meter. Then now we have where we are calculating the centimeter. So we are converting meter to centimeter. So this here, we use a parallelogram because that is used for input and output. Because we are doing a calculation right here, you will notice now that we have a rectangle. So the rectangle will have the calculation that you are doing. It's not that you're going to draw the shape and leave them blank. Inside of each shape, you must enter the text as to what is it that you are doing. So here now, as I was saying before, you're calculating um, you're converting meter to centimeter. So here we have centimeter, which is the variable name, is equal to meter times 100. You're also converting the meter to millimeter. So millimeter is equal to meter times 1,000 right here. So here we have another parallelogram because now we are outputting to the user the meter, the centimeter, and the millimeter. And as I said, once you have start, you must have stop. So this flow chart is flowing in a downward motion because it is based on a sequence and there is no, um, there's nothing else to a sequence other than input process and processing and output. Good. <laughs> All right, so sequence, now we're finished with sequence. Let's say there is, let's look on how is it our algorithm will be represented using if statement, if it is that you are supposed to have if, if you're supposed to have a for loop, if it is that you are having a while loop in your algorithm, good? All right, so here we have di a diamond. So diamonds are used for decisions. Your decisions will span from your if statement. Your decision will span into your um, loop. Your decisions will span, yes, loop. That's a bounded or unbounded iteration. So, so same thing now, in your diamond, you're going to have the condition. You can use back the word if, the word while, the, the word for, or you can structure it like a question. Is C not equal to zero? Is C equal to zero? And then branching from that, you will have true, which is going to signify that C is, equal, is not equal to zero in this case. So if it is one, if it is two, if it is three, if it is four, then you would show the true part, the false part too the condition itself. So again, you can structure the information inside of this shape as a question, or you can write it back just as how you have it in your algorithm, right? So you can have it while C is not equal to zero, right? If C is equal to zero or for C equals one to 10, whatever you want to write in it. But ensure that the condition is in it and it is structured whether as a question or as you have it in your algorithm. Good. All right. So here now you have our circle. Your circle is used as connectors and it is very much different than that of your oval. So the oval is used to signify start and stop. Your circle is used as connector. Basically, it is used to connect the flowchart that you have on a page to the flowchart that you have on a next page. Um, normally, that's one way that you use your circle. Next way that you can use your circle is when it is that you are joining your diagram coming from, let's say, an if, an if statement. You have one section where you have if a particular condition is true and it branches to the right. You have a next condition, um, you have a next branch whether the condition is false. How is it you connect that back now to give you an output you would use a connector? 
it is probably just in the wind right now, but as we look on the different examples, you'll understand the whole concept better. All right, moving on now. So let's look on an example here. So we're looking on decision making using selection. So once I say selection, if statements should come to mind. All right, so here we have a condition. So it is saying if num1, so if num1 is greater than num2, what should happen? Just the condition, but you could have is num1 um, greater than num2, just like how you have it here. Or you could have if num1 greater than num2. Good. So we have branching from this diamond no you have going to the left no oh, right going to the right you have false going to the left you have true right so what should happen if the condition is true what should happen if the condition is false good so if the condition is true if the condition is true, sum is equal to num1 plus num2. If the condition is false, then you're going to find the difference. So difference is equal to num1 minus num2. Good? All right. So I didn't want the, made the box in there. So I did something. I don't know exactly. I probably don't look for proper work. I did that. So here we have start, then we have our parallelogram, which is storing whatever the user entered. Moving from that, we are going to move straight into our diamond, which is our decision here. So here we have, um, we're asking, is mark greater than 89? Good. So if the mark is greater than 89, what should happen? That's the yes part here. So we're going to go over to this section, which means that we're going to output excellent. Good. If the mark is less than, nothing should happen. So basically here we have a circle, which is based connecting your, your diamond with this part here. All right. So here now, this is one shape on this side, right? Branching down here. Then now you have your diamond. If you had your diamond going straight to stop, what it would mean is that, well, what it would mean is that this would be over here by itself, just floating in the wind. Everything is going to connect back on, give an output or come to stop. Good? So here now your diamond going to yes. If this arrow was not here connecting using your connector and it moved directly to stop, then this part of your flowchart over here would just not be connected. And that in itself would be incorrect. So even when you have the branching from itself, you must connect it back all together. Let's look on a next example. All right, all right, so we have start again to show the beginning of our flow chart. Parallelogram here, which is showing um, what is it that we are getting from the user. So we are getting mileage and we're getting engine size. Then now we have a decision here. So is the engine size greater than 1500? Good. So if the engine size is 1600, then we're going to go to the yes section, which means that allowance and we're going to calculate allowance, good? Allowance is equal to mileage times 100. So we have a rectangular, a rectangle here because we are doing calculation. If the engine size is less than 1500, then that's no. So what is going to happen now is that allowance would be mileage times 80. So here, if the engine size is greater than 1,500, then allowance is equal to mileage times 100. 
if it is less than, then mileage allowance is equal to mileage times 80. Good. Now, note now that right here, we have yes and we have no. Good. We need to connect this back so that we know basically here. So we would say this is our ending. We're connecting it back to see how is it that the program comes or the algorithm comes to full circle. You can't have it and then you branch from one shape going to um, right allowance. So if the right allowance was underneath no, what it means is that this output would only occur if it is that the condition is false. In the same way, if you connected it just to the yes shape on this side, it would only mean that this output would only occur if the condition is true. So what you do is that you connect both shapes with your connector and from your connector, now you're going to have your output and then from that shape, you will have your stop. So in this case, let's say this is an if statement, you would have this is your if, this is your end if. So basically we're merging back everything right here and then we're outputting. So this output will only occur based on whether the condition is true or false. Good? Then we have our stop. So we're looking on another example here. Repetition now. So your repetition is a little bit different. So let's look on that. So we have our start followed by our instructions to the user and we're accepting description and price. If the price, so in this case, we're going to continue while the price is not equal to zero. Good. So what should happen if the price is not equal to zero? You're going to write description and price. So we are all putting the price list here. Good. Um, so we're going to ask the user again, enter the information so that it will continue to loop. So here, if you look on the diagram, from read description to price now, we have an arrow pointing back to our condition. Notice there's no connector here. Good. So based on this now, we are going to accept an initial price and description. So let's say the person entered bread and the price of bread is $20. It's going to check if the price is equal to zero. In this case, price is not equal to zero. So it's going to output the list bread price $20. Good. Then it's going to repeat which means that the person is going to enter another um, item description and another price. That is this part here. So this part is signifying that, listen, this part is supposed to happen again. You could have an arrow pointing from here going right to this section so that you show that that is the loop. But here in it, we have the, the, the output again. So here we are going to ask the user to enter a different price when the person enters the description and price now, it's going to go back to the initial loop here and check again if the price is equal to zero. So if the person entered sugar at $120, it's going to go and output it. Then it's going to ask the question again, what is the price? No. So if the person is supposed to enter the price of an item and that price is zero, then the program is just going to automatically stop. And that is why we have stop here. So here, this part is connecting it back, coming back to our decision. And then from the decision after checking, it will stop depending on what the user entered. All right, let's move on to another example. All right, so create a flowchart from the following pseudo code.
All right, so look on the question now. So here we have start, then we're going to accept the three numbers from the user in our parallelogram. Then we're going to calculate average. Average is equal to num1 plus num2 plus num3 divided by three. Note that we did not use the same parallelogram here. We use the rectangle because we are carrying out a calculation. Good. After it is now, we are going to output average. So we start input, processing, output, stop. So this now is for a sequence. Good. So we have our oval signifying start. Accept the part where we ask the user to enter a three numbers. Then now the calculation, which is calculating average, then we are all putting average, then we have stop.